Hello, you're welcome to the latest episode of the Attic Sessions. This time, we're in the historic city of Armagh. So we've come to Armagh to visit the John Hewitt Summer School, now in its 29th year, and presenting an eclectic mix of poetry and fiction readings, workshops, political discussion, cultural chat, amazing music and theatre, and general good crack. So we're now talking to Bill Jeffrey, who is a member of the committee of the John Hewitt Society and very much part and parcel of what goes on here all week. Bill, tell us, I mean, how's it been going this, this particular, it's the 29th year, isn't it? It is fantastic. This morning at breakfast it was called a linchpin. A really? linchpin? I'm not even sure what that is, but I'm not the linchpin. We're a team together and this has been, so far, and this is Friday, one of the best ever. I don't know what was different, but everybody came together. We had new blood on the committee. Uh, we had a guy called Stephen who was in charge of the bursary holders and all that worked well and all the contributors turned up and you weren't bad. Thank you You were gorgeous. I'm, I appreciate that. <laughs> and how would you encapsulate the experience, the John Hewitt experience? Because it doesn't feel like anything else pretty much that happens on this island. It's not and I suppose it has a uniqueness and it's hard for me to just describe that but we're terribly passionate, the whole committee is passionate and we all bring our own personalities to it. We're not, we're a team but we're an individual in that team and we're able and allowed to express our concerns and our passions and our to help people understand literature and poetry and all the arts through the prism that is Hewitt mm -hmm. and that, that's what we do and, and it, it's a magic thing I, I couldn't if I could bottle it and sell it I'd probably make a fortune but but it's just it's one of those things it mm -hmm. works for us so if John Hewitt were here today do you think he'd be sitting up at the bar would he be at the front seat of every reading what what do you think his demeanor as a guest would be I have huge admiration for him but he was an old curmudgeon so he was <laughs> and and he wasn't, uh, uh, he didn't verbalise an awful lot, but he was a fantastic writer and a great thinker. And, I mean, he didn't become a, a, a citizen of Belfast just by chance. He had something in him that even our reluctant city council at that time recognised, you know, even though they sent him to Coventry. Where would he be in it? I hope he would be standing watching everything, missing nothing, and just giving the lightest nod of approval to it. That sounds like a great, a great uh, accolade for the society and for the summer school. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. So live in the way Shulez tide. One evening wave is its bank of clouds. One sees the grass fires raise their smoke. Flowers grow in the sunken lanes. There's still a glimpse of daylight and a boy in an iron grey smock bows to a rut to tie his shoelaces. No slack in his life, no trace of absence. Out, thinking the end of the world to be at the horizon, the boy walked for hours. After his people scour the fields for miles around, crying his name to the four winds, to no reply. At twilight they found him where he'd last been seen, standing in the stable yard, unable to say anything about where he had been in that full circle he had walked beyond out, having no words for what he had seen beyond those that were of home. Carlo Gebler. Thank you very much for talking to us today. Um, is this your first time at the John Hewitt Summer School? No, I've been here mm, four or five or six times, usually doing the same thing, teaching, teaching primarily how to write short stories. And indeed, this is the 39th, no, 29th, 29th. In John Hewitt International Summer School, and I have been here for three days teaching the short story or how to make a short story to um, a highly talented eclectic group of uh, students. 
how do you think that this summer school is different to other sort of arts festivals in the area? In the area or in Ireland? Either. Okay, it's different to other festivals in Ireland in as much as it's more overtly political. And it, that, that is not to say that it is, it is, you know, not cultural or not literary, but it is overtly, it, 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 it consciously attempts to, you know, braid, I think that's the word, political discourse. You can see I'm a frustrated polytechnic lecturer, should be smoking a pipe, and art, literary art. Okay, so do you think that mix works? Well, as the world is going to hell in a handcart, never has it been, it, 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 the, the, this, this mix has never seemed more necessary or more important or more useful. Because certainly from a southern perspective, you know, we hear conversations up here that we never hear down south. Uh, I mean, I, listen, uh, the, world is a, the world is a broad church and can, can you know, carry all sorts of different things. There are many wonderful literary equivalents of this in the South, which deliver enormous pleasure and delight, uh, both to the participants, people like me, and to the, to the, to the paying public. Um, and different, different, inst different festivals do different things. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I wouldn't hold it against festivals in the South that they're not overtly political. The, the McGill Summer School is overtly political. That would be the exception. But they do other things. So, can I ask what you're working on at the moment? Uh, I have been writing a play called The Trial of Colonel Robert Lundy. Oh, so who is Robert Lundy? Robert Lundy is burnt. An effigy of Robert Lundy, 40 foot high, is burnt by apprentice boys in Derry uh, in December every year. Lundy was the governor of Derry and is allegedly um, uh, or was allegedly a closet Jacobite who wanted to deliver Lundy, uh, wanted to deliver Derry to the, ja the Irish Jacobites, James II, the besieging army who surrounded Derry. And that's why his effigy is burnt by the apprentice boys. He was arrested. He was spirited out of Derry by governors Walker and um, Baker. And he went to Scotland, he was arrested, he was put in the tower, and eventually he was released. He was not brought back to Derry for trial as a traitor, and Governor Walker was one of the people who said no jury in Derry would convict him. So what we are doing is pretending that Lundy, who died in 1712, is still alive, and we are bringing him back to Derry to try him before his peers. So when will this be on stage? When will this be on stage? I, I, I don't know. I mean, next year or the year after. Theatre does take a long time, and this has got a large cast of people. We're hoping to put it on in the courthouse. And, um, we, we're, we, and if you want to do something like this, which involves audience participation, because the audience will have to judge and pass, you know, will have to, they are the jury. It takes, that takes time, you know, to finesse and organize. And then earlier this year, I had a little play at the Ulster Museum uh, about a, a VAD, voluntary aid detachment nurse in the First World War from Newry, whose paintings have just been purchased by the Imperial War Museum, I think. It's a little play about her. So this year has been devoted to the theatre, a place I never thought I would find myself. Life is wonderful in what it brings you. Life is absolutely wonderful, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I want to write a book, I'm working on a novel set in the 60s in London, uh, pre-60s, and I want to write um, a kind of equivalent of Lytton Strait, She's Eminent Victorians, about um, libel trials in Ireland, taking four really fantastic libel trials and using them in the way Strait she used his, his characters, Manning and Florence Nightingale, uh, Matthew Arnold and Gordon of Khartoum and eminent Victorians as a way of talking about a whole country and a whole world view. That sounds like a, an amazing concept. Do you know which four libel trials? Yes, I'm the, probably the Mary Travers, 
um, the Boss Sinclair, at which Beckett was the primary uh, defense witness um, and was vilified. Um, how could you believe the testimony of a man who has written an author, who has authored a book called More Pricks Than Kicks? Um, the uh, the, 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 uh, the Kavner Gogarty and the Kavner leader trial with John Costello led the defense of the leader and absolutely crucified Kavner and destroyed him. I mean, they became friends afterwards. Yeah. Those four, and then there are there, the, the Honor Tracy case, possibly. There might be a fourth or a fifth. Uh, sorry, a fifth or a sixth. Right. Yeah. Those are the, those are the th that is the answer to your question. That is what I'm attempting to work on. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. My pleasure. The memory keeper's frame barely disturbed the patchwork quilt covering the bed in which she lay. Constance recognised Honor as soon as she saw her again. Although what lay before her was a shrunken version. She remembered her because of the memory keeper's hair. It had surprised her then and still made an impact. Her hair was grey, a pewter shade from crown to tip. An antidote to grey had been discovered and a monthly shot could hold it at bay. Nobody's hair need to change colour as they aged unless they were willing for it to happen. Few were. Honour was propped against pillows, eyes closed and breathing laboured. The quilt was tucked under her armpits and she gripped a corner between her fingers. It seemed to comfort her to have something to hold. Lines from Beloved's pearls were sewn into the quilt squares. Mustn't grumble, lay close to the shriveled hand that curled on top. Honour opened eyes with lashes sticky from sleep. Tired, she croaked. I can come back another time, Constant offered at a louder pitch than normal. Time. No, not much left. Honour sifted a sigh through her lips. Her skin lay on the bedside table, reminding Constance to remove hers. She laid it beside Honour's. An old face and a young face. They didn't look much different. So we are now talking to Karen MacDonald, who is here for the week as a bursary recipient at the John Hughes Summer School. So Karen, thanks for talking to us. Um, so what, what's, how do you get a bursary and what's that whole experience like? Well, in my case, um, you get on social media and somebody puts up a link to the bursary. Now I knew about the school. And um, I, I suppose I kind of knew in the back of my head there was a bursary, but I just saw the link to it and I was being lazy with a cup of coffee and I just said, oh sure, here I go. And I went in and I filled in the bursary online and it is actually very easy to fill in. You know, some places they ask for references and a lot of stuff, so um, it's very accessible. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a phone call to say, yeah, you've got a full bursary. They do ask about your uh, financial situation, which can help or not, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. So what's involved? What do you do as a bursary recipient? Um, I think really they just expect you to turn up and participate fully as possible. And, uh, and you're given every encouragement to do so. So um, you just enjoy yourself and participate in the workshops and we got to choose give say our choices one two and three and uh, then just go to as many of the seminars the talks the readings and I think a great deal of it is about engaging in the fact that the John Hewitt is in the north the fact there's a very specific uh, southern element to the bursaries and they're actually sponsored by the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs which I didn't know until I came up and uh, I think that's the idea it's just culture always culture always crosses boundaries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I think really the idea is to cons consider that and to really engage mm -hmm. so what would you say your highlight has been of the week Ooh, that's a difficult one um, I loved Leontia Flynn's talk because I think it really addressed something very important in terms of how we are living our lives at this sort of 
technical pace and technology and the effect it's having on what she was calling that space where you have this kind of space to create mm -hmm. and more even to contemplate before you even start creating. Mm -hmm. I think that was a very interesting talk and it was also very amusing which mm -hmm. is good mm -hmm. and she also brought up which is also very important I think and Sinead Morrissey alluded to it as well in her last introduction to her poetry about this feeling of commercialization of third level education mm -hmm. and about what I call people knowing the, the price of everything and the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I really enjoyed that and I loved um, the readings with Sinead Marcy and Sarah Howe, I thought. Mm. Uh, poetry, I suppose, because it's what I'm most interested in. Mm. There's been a huge variety, which mm -hmm. has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think you'll be back? It, it has, it's a festival that tends to get its little tentacles into you and hang on. I'd like to come back, I would. It might be another year or two because the thing about Ireland at this point, there are festivals on in in every corner and it's lovely I think to to sort of try and experience as many as you can or you can afford which is even more important so I, I do feel very blessed mm -hmm. to have got this bursary because I wouldn't I wouldn't have made the effort maybe to travel up and mm -hmm. try and get accommodation for a whole week and everything but it is one of those festivals you can see why people come back to it mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 very well run mm -hmm. and a great variety of um, talks and readings mm -hmm. and friendliness is is oh, very great. much so yeah, yeah th that's the one thing you could just uh, watching the faces of the people who are running it and who are uh, introducing the writers you can feel this sort of collegiate atmosphere where everybody is um, their aim is the one aim that they want everybody to have a good time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. really enjoy themselves mm -hmm. and yet be very stimulated by what's on offer yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. You're welcome. I used to think, I used to think I needed to sleep. It sucked me down in long dreams of daybreak. I used to say, do what you know how to do. I do. Nervously, I enter the ruined priory. I greet the bat bats and pigeons. I fall asleep. And at once, roaming again backstage, a new step feels higher than the old one. The dressing room doors rehung, but the old tune played on the keypad freezes in memory, locked in the moment I wrote it there. The knitted shawl dumped when the moths riddled it, gone. The car scrapped long since, discs and logbook squashed in the wakeful mill that once consumed the house keys years ago saved from Cordoba. The tunes, though, the boys of Blue Hill, Miss Canty's reel, the orchestral variations with the lewd words added to the symphonies will follow me when I wake, if I ever wake again. In case anybody goes looking for Miss Canty's reel, it does exist, but it was never written down. It was a tune she wrote herself. I remembered as a paperback biography of Sean O'Casey with the portrait of him on the cover. Palladin was the publisher, and he's there as a young man in the portrait. But I'm fairly certain I read it there, but I'm not going to go back and check at this stage. But it struck me that he's hurling here, and he's hurling for St. Lawrence O'Toole's. I think he was the secretary of the club for some time. But it struck me that what he's doing is what anybody's trying to do when they're trying to write something to make meaningful contact with something in flight, and without any clear knowledge of what the thing is or where, where you want it to go. So this is what O'Casey is doing, really, up in the half-forward line. Very light on his feet, but the eyes aren't great. <laughs> it's, it's just eight lines, two stanzas, and one sentence, a question. O'Casey hurling. How far from 2020 can his vision have been to take a bird in flight for a 50-50 cross, to connect with it in mid-air, and send that ball of blood and bone and feather soaring over the bar. So I'm talking to Terry Siofalo, who is over for the month of July in Armagh with a group of American students and who's taking in the final week with the John Hewitt Summer School. Terry, why are you here? 
Well, we love to bring our students to the John Hewitt because it's sort of a culmination of everything they've been learning about Northern Ireland, Ireland, even the United States while they've been here in this month. So we get to experience different cultural and political points of view through stories, through poetry, but also through debate and discussion. So it's a really well-rounded, robust capstone for a month-long experience here. And is the summer school um, replicated in, in America? Would students have come across this sort of thing before? Oh, this is very often their first experience at something that we might consider, say, an academic conference. You know, I've mentioned that it's not Comic-Con. No one's dressed up in their favorite superheroes. So um, it's a little different than what a conference might be. Certainly the breadth of topics covered, that it's not just focused on poetry or just focused on politics, that it's sort of this broad spectrum all over the map, uh, multidisciplinary approach to, um, to understanding who we are and what we're doing. So it's a very unique experience for the American students. And they actually get to put a show on themselves during the week. Absolutely, I think that's one of the best parts. So uh, while we're here, we are working on journalism pieces, poetry, short stories, um, some of them work on novels uh, and plays. And we take all of that and put it together in an hour long presentation that we do at, for the Hewitt participants. So we've been hosted by Hewitt now for five years and we're incredibly grateful to their support for Armour Project without a sort of a platform for the students to sort of reflect back all the work that they've been doing, we'd probably be missing the most vital part of what a writing program ought to be. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Sometimes when I'm asked about that summer and my month by the lake, what I remember most are the walks I took with Keller. I never met a person so pent up with story. Evenings we walked in the fruit orchards among the apple and cherry trees. On the vines, the grapes were just turning ripe. Keller was writing a piece about Israel. He'd been working on it for years. It kept taking him back there to talk with ex-soldiers from the IDF about what they'd seen, what they'd done. He kept contact with one girl in particular and went back year after year just to see how she was coping with her post-traumatic stress disorder and her depression and her guilt. You know what they do, the IDF. It's routine for them to tunnel through the walls of houses. They'll tunnel the length of a street just because they have a suspicion about someone, just because they can. They make their way through walls, house by house, and there's nothing the Palestinians can do. Suddenly, the Israeli army is there in the living room in the middle of the night. So Keller's contact is with her unit, and they're going through walls, house by house. They come to the address where their suspect lives. There are babies crying, frightened children, men in their underpants, and a hole in the wall where the army have tunneled through. And the soldier is being told to take the women into the other room. The Palestinians are to be strip searched, all of them, even the grandmother, just in case. And this is where the soldier balks, just in case the grandmother has hidden explosives in her fanny. Fanny is Keller's word. I don't know what the soldier would have used. Perhaps it doesn't matter. She is supposed to take the women to the other room and start searching their bodies, only she can't do it. She thinks of her own grandmother. She disobeys the order. We are walking among vines in the evening light with the sun setting. The grapes are close to harvest, and something about the story and the way Keller tells it makes me stop and reach out and put my hands to his chest. I do not want him to go on. I do not want to hear any more. But Keller can't stop. He is quoting the girl's commanding officer. This, this is how we have put an end to suicide bombers in Jerusalem. We walk on then, out of the evening and into the yellow lit house. Keller goes back to his room and his writing. There isn't so much I can do after that. My hands are burning. My fingers can still feel his chest and the story in it, all the stories he has carried from Israel and how deeply they have tunneled into him and how badly they need to get out. The longest day of the year has passed 
It sped like Pythia in a chariot filled with bookshe syllables, yours for the taking. Now there will be less time for you to say more, and you have been known to speak in tongues, but not lately, dotling. I can take any old blather and you can give it. But that aching silence that never satisfies any gulf is the silence I've come to loathe. Throw out all full stops. Let your verse be brazen, but never irregular. Salute tongue in all its guises. Let tonglish hop on the bandwagon. Abbreviate to our playful words not yet invented in gibberish cant or slang. Give me garbled, slurred rasp a fricative on its own or, leading, or leaning on a noun. I'll take metaphor, babble, weight watcher words with no taste, jejun compounds or con words, whisper, puggle, click or clack words. Just speak or hold forever weasel or wicked words. Warm words that are worthless, putting down to size words that matter, that don't matter. So we custom here at so I am talking to Maureen Boyle and Malachi O'Doherty, who are stalwarts of the John Hughes Summer School. Thanks for talking to us. Um, if, Maureen, if I can start with you, what are you doing here? Okay. Um, I'm here as a representative at the moment of the Open University, and I take um, a memoir class across three days a week. Um, with, I think we had about 15 people in the class. Um, I've been coming to the Hewitt for years. I started off just coming as punters. I worked on the committee for about 10 years and now, as I say, I come to teach this class. So it's a great week. Um, it's, it's very full on, it's very intense. Um, but I think for anybody that's interested in writing or in interest in literature or I guess in culture and politics more generally, there's something very inspiring about it. Um, and something almost quite indulgent as well about just having a whole week to um, be completely absorbed in this different world. You know? mm -hmm. And this beautiful theatre I think adds to it as well. There's something very conducive about the openness and the light of the place, you know. And spending a week working with students, we only have those three short slots, but actually um, it's an amazing thing, especially with memoir, that you're working with people's stories. And there's always a few people in the group for whom it really is a very important week. You know, there's telling a story maybe for the first time, and you're helping them towards that, which is just a great experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Malika, you were here this week talking about your new book. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes, my new book is a biography of Jerry Adams. It's not published yet. Now, it was to have been published by now, but there's been a, a delay on that. Uh, but, well, you know, it, uh, we had a good event. Uh, I was interviewed by Emer O'Callaghan. Uh, we have a lot in common ourselves, Emer and I. She's, uh, we both have our memoirs of life in West Belfast. And, uh, you know, it went down well with the audience. I think, uh, you know, it produced a fairly, fairly active discussion and uh, without any without any blood being spilled. <laughs> Actually, one of the things yeah. that strikes me when I mm. do come here is that we, we hear conversations up here that Southerners never hear. You know, we're, you just don't have the sort of the conversation about the, the real issues, the, the mm. cross-community issues. Um, so, you know, I think more people should come up and listen to this kind of discussion. Well, if they want to hear about it, that's what they should do. This is where they will find it. Um, you know, there is uh, there's another argument here that we are dwelling too much on the past and that it's time we uh, shook it off and, and moved on. That's an argument that I'm involved in quite a lot. I personally think that uh, the past is still with us, the troubles are with us still, the legacy of a divided society is still with us, the division itself is still with us. So, uh, so I think we do have to have these conversations and in some ways we're only just beginning to find a space in which we can have them more comfortably than we might have had in the past. Uh, so, so I think perhaps we're going to have more of that rather than less. And Maureen, finally, can I just ask you, what are you working on yourself now, apart from teaching? Um, I'm trying to write a piece of memoir about um, an experience of doing a Yiddish course in Oxford in the 1980s and what that taught me about Judaism and about Israel, I guess, really. Um, and then also some poetry about my father using his papers. Um, so that's the two things, I suppose. That yeah. And I'm 
dabbling a little in pornography. Oh, good. Okay. Well, yeah. well you can't have enough. <laughs> well, it, apparently there is a demand for it. Uh, one of my short stories is going to be published in the autumn in an anthology edited by Mariella Frostop. So uh, my, my pornography has been validated and attested to from the highest uh, <laughs> realms of uh, London literary scene. You know? Well, we so. will promise to cover that when it comes out <laughs> I on, hope the, you will. on the subsequent day. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank very you. Much. Martin Tappy is the son of a famous traveller and the father of my unborn child. He's 17, I'm 33. I was his teacher. I'd have killed myself by now if I was brave enough. I don't think it would hurt the baby. His little heart would stop with mine. He wouldn't feel himself, leaving one world of darkness for another, his spirit untangling itself from me. At seven weeks or so, a fetus starts to move. Imperceptibly, they say, but I swear I felt a stirring yesterday, a tiny shifting, a shadow weight. I've been still and silent all these weeks, listening for him. I sit here with the curtains drawn and the TV <coughs> muted, waiting for a hint of something in the soft glow of things detonating, people bleeding, corpses being carried swathed in flags by dark-eyed men, people arguing and kissing and driving in cars, people opening and closing their mouths. I've measured his time from the actual minute, not from the first day of my last period, like a doctor would, where a woman would be having normal sex, a normal life, and wouldn't know one moment from another. But all my moments now are marked and measured, standing out in unforgiving light to be examined. Pat came back yesterday from weeks of work around the country, installing water meters. They had to stay in digs, he said. The work was round the clock. The day he left, he bent and kissed me on the cheek. His lips were cold. He paused before he straightened. I can't remember if I looked at him. That was on the second day of the seventh week. I stood at the TV room door last night and looked at him, stretched along the couch in his tracksuit bottoms and Liverpool jersey. Barefoot, unshaven, soft-bellied, defenseless. I'm pregnant, I said. He swung his head towards me and there was a sharp light in his eyes. Was it maybe joy? That extinguished itself after a moment, as he remembered. I told him the father was a man I'd met online, in the voice I always use to make him know I'm serious, low and even. He sat up, then stood before me and shouted, Jesus, just once. Then he raised his fists as though to punch me, but he pulled back and punched the air before my face instead. And he said, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. And he put his fists to his eyes and cried very hard, teeth bared, eyes closed, like a little boy who's just felt shocking pain. There wasn't much more to be said or done then, so he left. He was white as he walked with his gear bag towards the front door, two small discs of livid red in the centres of his cheeks. He looked back at me from the open doorway. He was ghostly, washed in pale orange light. Are we even now? His voice was low, almost a whisper. I didn't reply. I always loved you, Melody, he said. All I said back was, goodbye, Pat. So now I'm talking to three of those American students who've been here for the month. Uh, we have Amber, we have Marion, and we have Lexi. Amber, if I can start with you. Yeah, of course. Um, what's it been like being in Armagh for a month? Oh my gosh, it's been breathtaking. Like to to experience all of this, the the culture specifically has been probably my favorite part, as well as the view. Of course, the view. <laughs> but um, on top of it all, actually learning everything that we've been learning. Like I never really took poetry, and then I came here and had an amazing professor, and learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, and Marion, we were hearing that there was actually a, a performance as part of this week at the John Hewitt Summer School. What yes. was that like? 
Um, a little intimidating for me. I'm I'm not usually in um, theater, so I was like a little shaky, but um, I had a lot of fun. It was really fun um, writing um, what was presented, and then um, just practicing, and then putting it on for everyone um, mm -hmm. as it as kind of like a team. So mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and do you think that if you were asked to do something like that again, that you'd be more likely to go yes? That's oh yeah, of course, of course. I <laughs> uh, will no, you don't have to say it if you don't think well, that. No, I do. I would do it again for sure. Yeah. Lexi, yeah. what has your highlight been of the, the week and the month, I suppose? Oh, the week and the month? Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, specifically the Hewitt Festival, the highlight for sure was performing in it. I had never really done any of that before, not uh, stand up in front of a strange audience that you've never met before and say something that you've been working on. Uh, that was, it was amazing just to feel... At first I was nervous, and then it just subsided as soon as you got off stage. It was like, I want to do that again, but it's over, so I can't do it again. <laughs> it's a constant little struggle there. But I think just being in our ma for the month, one of my uh, favorite moments, or just moment, like favorite opportunities, I guess, was to travel. Because we were here, and we were kind of in a central location in Northern Ireland, and we could go up, we could go down. Uh, just seeing everything Ireland has to offer. There's so much to still see. <laughs> it's so sad we have to go so soon. Well, do you think you'll be back to three of you? I would, yes. I would come back. Yes, yes definitely. Yes. That is in my game plan. <laughs> that was the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, I know that I'm just a dreamer. I dream because it's the closest I'll ever get to you.